Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, We were in chapter 4 last week. We've made our way all the way to chapter 13, starting in verse 31, the lament over Jerusalem. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you are not willing. See, your house is left to you, and I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. So when I wrote this earlier in the week, obviously our lament was for our own space, but since then, we have a reason to be in a greater lament for our Muslim brothers and sisters in New Zealand. Um, Lament just means to grieve loudly, out loud, to name our grief, and uh, there is reason to grieve that people who want to worship are not always safe, and that People who are in so much pain and with so much anger respond in violence. So it has been a week. Can I get an amen? It has been a week. Though as always, this group has stepped up in so many wonderful ways. Our leaders stepped right up and and got what needed to be done in this place. And you all have offered such flexibility and support to us uh, as we go through Lent. We are very Lenty this year. Um, But it has also been a week for Jesus. Last week we left him in the desert, but he's left the desert and he started his ministry. This is nine chapters later. Since then, he's called his disciples. He's performed miracles and healings. He's cast out demons, and he has taught and taught and taught about God's love. And what has it gotten him? In trouble with the law. I mean, that's not surprising. At this point, John the Baptist has already been arrested and put into prison, So why wouldn't they come for Jesus too? Our passage today is actually in two sections. The first section is a warning, and the second section is the actual lament over Jerusalem, and we're going to look at each part. So I found it interesting that the warning in the first section actually comes from the Pharisees. That for once, Luke is actually kind to the Pharisees, that there were some religious leaders who supported Jesus, who wanted to protect him and keep him safe, because they get a bad rap in the scriptures, yes? They get only painted as uh, the bad people who don't seem to understand what's going on, and sometimes that still happens today. The people who are the most hateful or the loudest of the religion get the biggest microphone, when in fact most people in churches trying to lead religions are just trying to do their best with what they have. So it's always a good reminder to lean towards grace, uh, towards leaders. But there were Pharisees who saw what Jesus was doing and they wanted to protect him because they understood that what he was doing and his message was in fact dangerous. So they warn him about Herod which is a valid threat. This is not just trying to get him out of town or just trying to, you know, scuttle him under. This is real. This is valid. John is arrested. He will ultimately get beheaded. Before that, the same Herod we know when Jesus was very small, murdered all the innocents, all the children under two when Jesus was born, when the wise men came to visit. I learned that Herod changed his will three times and then just gave up and killed his firstborn son. He is a predator, like a fox. He feeds on fear, both his own and on others. And we don't know for a fact, according to the scriptures, what we have in the scriptures, whether Jesus is scared here. We know he is later in the garden when he is asking God if there is any other way than this crucifixion. So we know he can be. But in this passage... 
I love Jesus' response. We almost get like sassy, annoyed Jesus. Like, look, you tell that fox. I've got demons to cast out. I've got people to heal. My work's getting done whether Herod likes it or not. I wish I could always be like that when I'm faced with scary situations or people, but I don't. Sometimes I can, every once in a while, but when I do, it's only because the work that has to get done is so important, it's bigger than the fear. As this week remind us, the Pharisees' warning still rings true today. That faith and religion, and specifically following Jesus, can be dangerous. Especially if we start to follow him really closely, like we start taking him seriously, that what he says is how we should change our lives. When you start making your choices, changing them about your faith, people are going to start getting uncomfortable. It can be as small as, you know, each week, we didn't do it this morning, but most weeks we say, oh, check in on Facebook and let people know where you were and where you worshiped. We see that as evangelism, as a way of sharing our faith, but a member shared with me this week that somebody got on him and said he was bragging about his faith and kind of, he stood by it and that wasn't going to change him. I said, you could tell him that your female pastor told you to do it and that could start a whole other discussion. (laughs) But when we start making significant different choices in our lives, if we start spending our money differently because of our faith, if we start spending our time or the ways we want to engage our family and our faith, people can get antsy. People can get uncomfortable. When we start offering radical hospitality to a wide group of people, especially ones that are used to being on the outside, people start leaving church and taking stuff with them. We saw that last week with the Methodists. And there's this other side of what it means to be dangerous, and Shane Claiborne reminds me of this. He's a author, and he's not a pastor, but he's a modern monk. And his quote says, perhaps there is no more dangerous place for a Christian than, to, than in safety and comfort, detached from the suffering of others. I think that's why Jesus is so often so frustrated with his own people. He saw how they kept choosing safety and comfort over trusting in the protection and care of God which people do all the time because our fear is real. Fear of rejection is real. Fear fear of being left behind if we don't keep up with everybody else. There's the fear that we are, in fact, not strong enough or courageous enough. We have a fear that we just don't know enough. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to lead the Bible study. I don't know how to do the social justice. What if I do it wrong? There's the fear of change, that the church won't be the way I like it to be, or it was the way when I felt the most connected to God. The fear that we will fail or look foolish or hurt the church. The fear is real that can keep us from doing the work and the ministry that we are called to do, the work that God has for us and who will ultimately, we believe, equip us to do it. Yes? We believe that God will equip us? Yes? Okay. Because what I learned, this really interesting thing at our first vision meeting this week, we had the the vision meeting, and uh, we're doing this asset-based initiative to think through uh, what the gifts are of the church and some of our strengths. And so the first question was about, what's your very best experience at church? When did you feel most connected Uh, to the spirit? When did you feel most involved in the church? And we got wonderful answers and wonderful discussions. Um, But what was interesting is almost every answer that that got mentioned or every experience that got mentioned was that they were asked to do things that they never thought they could or would want to do. They were often asked things that on the surface frightened them a little, or at least it intimidated them. It required courage for them to say yes to it. But they also, the other side of that, is they felt deeply, deeply moved by the church that trusted them to lead them in this way. That we placed our trust in 
them in ways they hadn't imagined themselves. They knew that they had been entrusted with important tasks. We didn't ask them to do the easy things. That's not the stuff they mentioned. It was when we asked them to do the hard stuff that they felt most connected, most involved, most tied to the spirit, whether that was mission trip, whether that was our children's faith formation, whether that was choosing a new pastor or leading the deacons or being an elder. They discovered their gifts and talents were deeply needed by both the church, but ultimately by the gospel itself. The work had to get done because it was important. Now, it didn't mean they weren't also afraid or nervous, but they knew they had ministry to do. If we believe that Jesus is fully human, which I do, I have to believe it is only natural that he is afraid in this moment, that his life is truly threatened. And yet he offers this powerful response instead of fear, or in not instead of fear, in spite of fear. And so we ask the question, how can we do that too when the fear is real? And I think one of the first things we do is we just admit it. We say it out loud. We're afraid. We're nervous. We call a spade a spade. Herod is a fox, and he's legitimately dangerous. Fear is real, and it tries to defeat love and hospitality and justice all the time. That we remember people who protest and march are still afraid. People who serve in the military on the front lines are still afraid. People who step in and stop bullying and violence are still afraid. People who serve as leaders, whether that's in businesses or churches or anywhere else, they will tell you they are still afraid. But they do it because they also know what they are doing is so important. So after we've admitted we read the second part of the passage. We remember Jesus' lament over Jerusalem, which is ultimately, he speaks about Jerusalem, but ultimately, no. All right? It's, it's fitting for the week we've had. It <laughs> and I even changed her batteries today, so I know you got a full charge. All right, so we're going to do it this way. There we go. So much better. So Jesus' lament, he states Jerusalem, but really what he means is all of Israel. What he means is God's people. He says, you keep killing God's messengers in order to be safe and comfortable. And he said, all it's gotten you is Roman rule and Herod as a king. How's that working out for you? Look at your government and the corruption in your religion by trying to protect yourself by clinging to your old, broken systems. How's that working for you? He says, that's the bed that you have made for yourselves. But here's what I love. We think of lament in this negative way, and yet what his lament is, his lament is that they have allowed fear to be a louder voice than God's voice that we have allowed the fox in and not remembered that God desperately wants to protect us, to cover us and bring us in with this wonderful feminine image of a hen gathering her children together. That we forget that God wants to offer us divine protection and care. Jesus laments that we have the creator of the universe protecting us. The one who set the the slaves free. The one who heals the sick and gives sight to the blind. What are we worried about? 
the God whose presence can literally duct tape our souls together when we think we can't possibly move forward in faith. That God is on our side. That God knows how to bring us in together and offer us protection. Lamenting is important. If I know anything or I know too much about a thing, it's about the importance of grieving. And you grieve all kinds of things. You can grieve people, but you can also grieve situations. You can grieve circumstances, things that we've lost or things that have turned out not the way we wanted to or hope. Just as Jesus' lament is real, ours can be too. That life might not be the way we imagined it to be. As I said at the beginning, there are many things to lament in the world today. There are reasons to be afraid. And I believe that Jesus would have preferred not to be hunted by Herod. That would have been a top choice of his. He would have liked it if everybody just simply followed and started changing immediately. He wouldn't have complained about that. What he laments is that we continue to suffer until we let go of these old habits and ways of being in these systems that continue to exclude and not love each other. He laments that, that there is a better way and we don't follow it. When we forget that fear is like a fox trying to hunt us down and steal away from us what is precious, our faith and our trust in God who is in fact not just enough but more than enough. He laments our short memories of what God has already done for us when we have felt the most afraid. That we forget that the work we have to do is deeply important. That we forget that there is, in fact, more love in the world than there ever will be hate and fear. And we get to be messengers of that good news. And that we don't have to do it alone. Just look around. We get to do it as a community. We get to do it as a church and as a family. Rosie Callahan told me a great story this week. You may have seen it in the news. It seemed a little too perfect for this week's uh, scripture passage. But apparently, there were chickens in a poultry farm in France who are suspected of killing a fox that tried to sneak into their hen, <laughs> into their coop. The guy who's the head of the farming said, there in the corner we found this dead fox. It was a herd instinct, and they attacked him with their beaks. He said the last time the fox visited one of the school's chicken coops more than a year ago, it turned out much worse for the hens. Not this time. The hens learned. You don't belong here. This is not your place. The fox is a predator. It has teeth and claws and is very quick just like our fears can be. But I learned that hens are deeply protective of their children. They will puff up, they will use whatever resources they have, even if they're limited, and they're gonna keep on doing what they need to do and keep safe who they need to keep safe. When we do this work, we don't do it alone. God does not leave us, and neither does this church family. Fear is always going to be a part of the human condition. It's going to try and get into our coop, but we aren't going to let it. I see Rosie being like, mm-mm. Because God has given us so many tools to face down fear. We have the tool of love. We have the tool of forgiveness and grace and prayer and all of those around us here. And we have work to do. We learned again this week there are demons that need to be cast out. There is brokenness in the world that, that needs healing, both for ourselves and for the world. So we need to tell that old fox we've got work to do, no matter what he has to say, because it is important, because it is the gospel, because we believe that is true. So this week, we continue to pray our way to Jerusalem even as we are lamenting. Last week, if you come up close, you can't see them from down there. There are little green pieces of paper stuck into our rock wall. 
It is appropriate this week that it is a wailing wall, a wall of lament, and you should have a blue piece of paper. You may have gotten it with your cookie. I invite you to take time and consider what is it that you are afraid of that keeps you from doing the ministry? What is it that you lament in the world, in the church, in your life? I invite you to write that down uh, and place it in the offering plate. If you don't have enough time, because you're singing or working in the service, we will collect these all week long, and they will continue to fill our walls, to fill our space with the prayers of the people who believe in Jesus, who believe in the gospel, who believe that we have more courage than we have fear. <laughs>